I'm Josh Jordan, co-founder of Brazilian Gold Coffee, here today with Jean and Daniel. I am a coffee producer here in Ibiraci, Minas Gerais, and Alto Magiana. My family has been in the coffee business for over 100 years with the group Eldorado Special Coffee. We are 100% focused on specialty coffee. I'm Daniel. I've worked with specialty coffee for 11 years. I'm a barista here in Brazil and am owner of a roasting company. I travel around searching for coffee producers that focus on quality and I take these coffees back to the city where I roast and distribute them. Over there, where you see all the green, this was the champion coffee in 2018 for the region of Alto Magiana. In 2010, we began to look for new ways to better our quality. This higher quality coffee was bringing to our group a much deeper satisfaction. We asked ourselves what we lacked in order to reach the perfect conditions in our land to grow specialty coffee. We discussed this with our mother, who planted coffee before us, and whose past labors have been so fruitful for our lives. We began by working with the soil and the equilibrium of the coffee plants. This brought many good fruits for us. In 2015, we began to participate in national and international contests. We became finalists in the Cup of Excellence four years in a row. We are rated in the top 25 coffees of Brazil, and we won the championship here in Alto Magiana in 2018 and again in 2019. We have so many things to show you. What's our story? What are we doing? How did we get to where we are today? Do you know why this region has the name Alto Magiana? Magiana was the name of an old train that ran through here 100 years ago. So they named this region after the train. Alto Magiana is a very privileged coffee growing region in Brazil. One of the best, without a doubt. Coffee that comes from Alto Magiana is generally full bodied with a medium acidity, a chocolatey taste, intense, and a nice, noticeable aftertaste. Incredible coffee, as they say in Portuguese, cafezão. Uma decisão eu já tenho comigo, de me voltar um dia à primeira morada e viver de novo junto ao povo amigo da Ibiraci que é minha namorada. Show this poem to your father. This is a little shoot that's coming out of the old flower and turning into a baby coffee bean. Are you seeing this? This is a flower that bloomed last week. Now it's dry and I'm going to take it off. See here? A little coffee fruit is forming. And here is a flower that has still not opened. Here we call this a piña. It will grow and bloom soon. All these will bloom. Look at this. It still doesn't have any coffee. It has not yet formed a coffee bean. All we see inside is the juice. It will begin to form the bean sometime in January. Here is the nursery for the coffee saplings for the El Dorado farm. In about 60 days, they will be ready to be planted in the field. These new plants receive only 50% of sunlight. In 30 days, we will see if it is time for more sunlight. So beautiful. Little babies? Yes, babies. These were planted in May, June, July, August, September. It's been five months. Last year, I planted 50,000 square feet of geishas, and this year, I will plant another 50,000. By 2022, I will have mature geisha plants ready. They are an exotic type of coffee and are a different and much sought after coffee profile here in Brazil. We don't think so much in terms of productivity as we do in quality and variety. 
Using this new technique, Saffir Zero, in one year the coffee plant produces 100% of its capacity. The next year we turn it into a skeleton plant with this process here. We cut back the sides and it will not produce anything in 2021, but it will in 2022. With this technique, we are able to cut back much of our cost and we only have to pass the harvest machine once every two years. We are also able to lengthen the lifespan of the plant as well. This Safra Zero technique has been very good. Brazil has been using this technique for 20 years. So these plants can live up to 20 years? No, they can live as long as 100 years. 100 years? Yes, some even more. But generally, they survive 30 or 40 years, then we replace them. Today our mechanical equipment reduces much of the lifespan of the coffee plants. We don't have enough manual labor in Brazil for the harvest. For example, today I have an area of 1,000 hectares of coffee. To harvest it all manually, I would need 1,200 people. The maximum number of people I can get would be only 100 people. So I have to use mechanical harvesters, or I would need to reduce my area. There is no alternative. Impossible to harvest this by hand, gringo. Impossible? Impossible. Here is running water, but right now, it's empty. Without this irrigation here, could anything live? It would be hard. This area is a bit lower, 800 meters in elevation. There in Iberasi, it is higher, about 1200 meters in elevation. There on top of those mountains. So here, we have to use irrigation. Here we use limestone, this white color right here. And what does limestone do? Limestone corrects the acidity in the soil. It gives the right pH balance. It adds calcium and magnesium also. It's very important for the development of the coffee. Here in the El Dorado group, we are continuously seeking out new ways to reduce man-made additives in the coffee growing process. We are still unable to be organic because we are in an area of very high elevation of about 1200 to 1300 meters above sea level. The high elevation brings much quality to the coffee, but on the other hand, it can also harm the plants because this region experiences cold temperatures and high winds. We have limits when it comes to using only organic products, but today we are increasing our use of biological products that are natural and natural enemies of the diseases that attack coffee plants. We are beginning to apply these new methods using natural products. We have been able to reduce the amount of man-made products used in the growing process by about 50%. So, I believe strongly for coffee growers, not only in Brazil, but all over the world, not in strictly organic coffee, but in applying biological methods and products so that we can reduce the use of man-made products without sacrificing the quality of the coffee itself so that the region produces excellent and healthy coffee. We will put a red netting here on the top. Then we put the coffee here on top of the netting. When we don't use the nets, we take them off so that they will not be damaged when the rains come. Then we will put the netting back on in May. So these are all African raised beds. We have here 2,000 square meters suspended. And there we will have 4,000 square meters. The two combined are 6,000 square meters of suspended beds. Here all the coffee beans we process are from micro lots. So these coffee beans stay in, as it were, a six star hotel. They are suspended, receive wind, the temperature never passes 30 degrees Celsius. It may be 40 degrees under the sun, but here the conditions are perfect for them to experience the best possible quality, like royalty. We have various processes here. We have a netting on the bottom, we place coffee on top, then we put another netting on top for shade. They stay here for 20 days until the beans reach a moisture level of 11%, 20 or 25 days. Here is the farm El Dorado 2. There is where we process the post-harvest, and there we have machines that dry, separate, and depulp the coffee. Let's go there now. Here. So here, call it, I don't know in English, but in Portuguese it's patio, 
it's oh, wet. Patio. Patio. Yeah, patio. It's sun dry. So, oh, cool. coffee came here from the harvest and they put the coffee here on the ground and dry it in the sun dry. Now we're coming to the final process of the coffee. You gonna climb up there? You can climb if you want. Here is the coffee harvester. This machine does the work of 120 people. Per day? Yes, every day. One machine. This machine collects 1,000 acres of coffee per day. 1,000 acres of coffee is 150 sacks of coffee every day. Clean coffee. The name of this machine is the Jacto Harvester. It's one of the most modern harvesting machines in Brazil today. It works with a system of vibration. Here are the shakers. The shakers here work by shaking and vibrating to collect the coffee. It does damage the plant when it shakes and it will significantly shorten the lifespan of these plants. I believe we began using a mechanical harvester in 2006. We've worked with these harvesters for 15 years. Before this machine, we had coffee plants that lived to be 70 or 80 years old, plants that my great-grandfather planted. This harvester we use cuts the lifespan of the coffee plants down to 20 years. Then we have to cut the plants to the ground and allow them to regrow, or we have to completely uproot them and plant new ones. So there are pros and cons to using this harvester. But we can't do without it. So there's really no way to do your work without this harvester. There is no way. What did your great grandfather do before this technology? Back then, the areas we had for growing coffee were much smaller. 20 years ago, we had 400 hectares of farmland to grow coffee on. Today, we have three times that much area, more than 1,000 hectares of farmland. If you have an area that large, you're only going to have a limited amount of manual labor available for the harvest. Years ago, the manual labor was more concentrated in the farmlands, but industrialization has caused the manual labor to shift away from the farms to the big cities. Today's youth do not want to work on farms. These machines collect the coffee that has fallen to the ground. They are the coffee sweepers. So the coffee falls to the ground and the machine goes over it with the sweepers and sucks up the coffee. It sends it to the top where it is ready to be set out and washed. And this machine will throw the coffee into one of these carts. It will be moving and throwing coffee into one of these carts here. Are the carts behind the machine? No, they're at the side. Then there will be a tractor pulling one of these carts. If you look up here at the top, this is where the coffee exits. The coffee shoots out of here and into the carts. Then the coffee will be taken to the processing area to be dried, washed or peeled. This machine separates the coffee beans by size. So the coffee enters this machine, comes through here, then goes to this metal sheet with holes that vibrates. When the machine vibrates, the coffee beans are separated by size. It also removes waste. So the different size beans are placed in different sacks? Yes. Right here, everything is regulated. The waste and extra comes out here, and here the beans are separated by size. You control the outflow here. Is this empty? Yes, it is. This is called a granary. This is where the coffee is stored. It's really high, alto. So that's why they call this place Alta Magiana? <laughs> you want to climb up? Do you want to climb? Are you afraid? 
No. Daí sim. Yes, you are. Você tem medo. I can see it. Sim, você acha. Só não olhe para baixo. Hot. Very hot. A lot of space. Tons of space up here. Here is a turbine, and here a dryer, powered by fire. Because we are working to be as sustainable as possible, we do not use firewood. We use the coffee bean's own skin and place them in here to create a fire for the dryer right here. We use the same skin from our beans. So the turbine grabs the hot air and pushes it into here. And in here is how much coffee, Jean? 15,000 liters? 15,000 liters of coffee. This cylinder will continuously rotate. The inside temperature is 36 degrees Celsius. So it continues to rotate until the beans reach the desired moisture level. I really like this coffee dryer because with it, I am able to control the temperature. Outside in the outdoor drying area, on a very hot day, 36 degrees to 38 degrees Celsius, the temperature can climb to 60 degrees Celsius within the fruit. The fruit is alive. Here, I can control the temperature. At the maximum, it will be 36 degrees. Because fruit is alive, it's not good for it to pass over 40 degrees Celsius. It's the same thing with us. If our body temperature goes above 40 degrees, we are burning away our fat reserves. So for coffee, its fat reserve is sugar. But if the coffee fruit is burning, it is burning its fat reserves, and its fat reserve is sugar. And if its sugar is burning, you are burning away the quality, and so you are losing the quality. So much of the world's coffee is losing its quality after the harvest because of poor methods of drying the coffee outdoors. So the coffee skins, or husk, come from in there and fill this storage. From here, they unload this into a cart. And what do you do with the husk? All of this can be used to fertilize the soil, or it can be sold. So the coffee comes here and stays for 45 to 60 days resting after the processing. Here, the coffee will gain two or three points in quality just by resting. So the coffee comes here to be washed and it is placed into this funnel. From here it goes to be washed and separated. We separate the ripe coffee fruit from those that float on top of the water. The ripe fruit goes on one side, the fruit that floats on the other side. Next, these two machines over there will peel the fruit. After they are peeled, they go to the outdoor drying area. You understand about the fruit of the coffee, right? The coffee fruit is made up of the skin or husk, and below this husk is the mucilage. It's the pulp of the coffee. If the coffee fruit sits out too long, sometimes it loses its mucilage. It becomes drier, so it floats on top of the water. When we put the coffee into the water, the ripe fruit stays on the bottom and the dry fruit floats to the top. So the coffee that floats has less quality? No, just different, not necessarily less quality. Look at these birds, toucans, seriously. Look closely at this bird. Look at that large beak. We have many toucans here, and they are becoming a plague. They eat everything. They are carnivores, and they eat the eggs of smaller birds. They're beautiful, but a problem. There is where we deal with irrigation. From there comes all the water for the entire farm. We have two million liters of water conserved here. Here, water. We have a lot of good machinery to pump this water all over the farm. 
And does it come from underground? It is artesian water coming from underground springs. You can swim in there, but you may not be able to get out. Brazilian water, very good. So your mother and father live there? Yes, they are hidden away in here because of the COVID-19. They don't get out much. It's smart to keep them safe, huh? Yes, yes, keep them right there. This is my mother's coffee, my mother and father. What's your name? Lucas. Lucas. Can you explain what you're doing here with the coffee? I am classifying the coffee. We classify the coffee and take away all the impurities here. After this, we put them in the roaster right here. The rest, we put in this hole in the table right here. Is this for waste? This is where anything goes that has defects. What is your name? Murilo. I am roasting coffee, and I am close to finishing the roast, the part of the caramelization. We are towards the end of the caramelization phase. You can see that the coffee is developing, and we will soon arrive at the profile we want. Here we use something called a volcano process. It's the slowest way we dry process coffee outdoors. We select some of the coffee fruit, then send it to the patio to be stacked up like a volcano. They remain stacked for three to five days until the coffee fruit begins to stick to your hands. When it begins to stick to your hands, then we close up the volcano. So we close up the volcano in the evening, and in the morning around 8 a.m. we begin to open it back up until it is completely open. After this, we close the volcano up again until about 3 o'clock. Then we cover it up. We will continue this process for about 25 to 27 days until the coffee is done processing. This coffee is stacked about 2 meters high. 2 meters? Like this? Like Magic Johnson? Like this? And the coffee have a, a lot of fermentation inside so then we put the coffee on the ground and sun dry what's your name my name is elvis elvis never died so elvis is the brother of jian the coffee producer who gave us the tour of the farm and elvis is in charge of the distribution isn't that right yes and I also produce, and I'm in charge of micro lots. We try to find the right market for these coffees in Brazil and in other countries. And Daniel here helps us out. Let's try some coffee. Right now, we are going to sample an espresso made by Daniel. This coffee here was produced at my father's farm, Fazendo Eldorado. For us, we taste notes of caramel, brown sugar. It's very good coffee. The Brazilian Specialty Coffee Association gave it a high score of 87.2 points. 300 bags of this have gone to Japan. Let's let you try it and see for yourself. Mm. Great. Delicio. Smooth. With a suave. Very smooth. We have partners in Central America, Japan, South Korea, Russia, lots of countries in Europe, and we are very pleased with this. God willing, our coffee will have a strong presence in the United States as well.
Now is our time to show the American people that Brazil has very high quality coffee, and our farm works to achieve high quality coffee also. Our coffees here are in no way inferior to coffee from Colombia, Africa, or Central America. I believe that our coffee is just as good as these other countries, or even better.